Hello and welcome. This is another episode of The Thing About Cars. It is a wintry day here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, how are you guys doing? Wintry? Hey, I'm cold. <laughs> it's cold. cold. Is no it snow. Cold? Is it winter? <laughs> yeah, no snow. No, that's true. No snow. I just think it's cold, so I'm complaining. Around the table today, we have Dawn. You there? I am here and I'm shivering. And Ben? Hey, hey. Dave? I am here and I am shivering as well. <laughs> and our special guest, Arp? I'm here as well, Mick. Excellent. Welcome. And uh, let's start our episode with a grand trivia auto question. Um, in fact, I'm going to just hand the ball over to Ben since he actually already knows the answer to this question. So Ben, take it away. Yeah, this one came from our good friend, Tim Rogers. Uh, thank you, Tim. This is a good one. <clears throat> Basically, it's uh, having to do with the Lincoln brand of car, these nice big American luxury cars. And, uh, you know, it... Uh, where does the name come from, basically, is the question. The company, of course, was you know, started by Henry Leland, who previously had uh, been the, uh, the founder of Cadillac. He moved on and did another thing. Uh, so two for two for big luxury brands for Mr. Leland. Anyway, so where does the Lincoln name come from? Choice A is that uh, in 1917, Henry Leland chose to name his new car company Lincoln to honor President Abraham Lincoln. B, British immigrant... Richard Trevithick founded Lincoln Boiler Company in 1844. In Old English, Lincoln means fresh water. By 1909, Lincoln had completely switched from making industrial steam boilers to complete cars. Or C, Lincoln is the name of the ancient pharaoh's enormous palace in the center of Luxor, Egypt. Investors in Lincoln Motor Company thought the name conveyed wealth and exclusivity appropriate for a luxury car. <laughs> All three of them, excellent, excellent choices. Um, mm -hmm. So again, those choices are, I'm going to read them backwards, men. Lincoln is the name of the ancient pharaoh's enormous palace in the center of Luxor, Egypt. Investors in Lincoln Motor Company thought the name conveyed wealth and exclusivity appropriate for a luxury, luxury car. Uh, choice B was British immigrant Richard Trevithick. Can we just take a minute to appreciate that name, Trevithick? That's just <laughs> oh, yeah. funny. Yes. <laughs> it's great. He was a railroad pioneer, by the way. Ah, okay. So British immigrant, immigrant Richard Trevithick founded Lincoln Boiler Company in 1844. In Old English, Lincoln means freshwater. So by 1909, Lincoln had switched from making industrial steam boilers to complete cars. And then choice A was in 1917, Henry Leland chose to name his new car company Lincoln to honor President Abraham Lincoln. One of those is the right answer. Um, and uh, that takes us to our next segment, which belongs to Dave. Dave's got a cultural collision for us today. What have you got? Well, you know, so um, I've spent the weekend um, putting up Christmas decorations because our house is, is a production at Christmas. And, and as I was doing it, um, I, I glanced at something online and happened to see um, Christmas vacation, specifically Cousin Eddie pull up in his motorhome. So I thought we would actually talk today about motorhomes and the role motorhomes play in, um, in American culture. Um, so the starting point, I was like, okay, I, I poured myself a drink last night and started Googling history of motorhomes. And what's interesting, actually, when you when the industry itself points to the Conestoga wagon as the um, origin of the motorhome, because you know, the Conestoga wagon and, and uh, you know is what opened up the America West and. Um, this yeah, idea. that makes sense. That I mean, you put all your stuff in there. You put all your stuff right? in there. You haul it. You live in it. Um, and I had always thought, you know, oh well, certainly it was older than that because I was thinking of images of the Roma in Europe living in like horse-drawn carts. And, and actually, though the Roma didn't move into those kind of um, carts until like the mid 1800s. But the earliest, um, what we would consider a motorhome, went to the market in 1910 um, when the Pierce Arrow Motor Company introduced the Turing Landau um, at the Madison Square Garden Auto Show. And it was, this was not, um, the, in many ways, it was not a motorhome in the way we think of it. It was specialized, it was more of like for camping in mind because it was just full of cargo compartments for your camping equipment, your tents, your stove. Um, there was even an onboard toilet put into the car. Um, fortunately, no drawings of that survive. 
And then sometime like in the 1920s, individual builders started, you know, converting panel trucks and buses, specifically with the idea of that, you know, people w- would tour and camp in these things. Um, and the industry, you know, if you look at some of the early stuff, it really borrows all of this design from the early innovations of aircraft. Um, and during World War II, the whole industry um, shut down because of the war and then didn't really start coming back into the 1950s. Um, and that was actually when the term um, uh, house cars was converted to motor home. Um, and you began having um, the creation of all of these motorhomes, including the most fam- famous one, the Winnebago. Yes. <laughs> we had many. <laughs> you, well, and yeah, you know, I remember you ta- saying this in a, in a show before, uh, that we before, and then we had talked about it um, separately, that your family had a lot of motorhomes, right? A right. lot. From the time, I, I can't. Time in memoriam, I literally cannot remember when we didn't have a house on wheels. And the stories and all of the movies that lend themselves to the crazy things that have happened in a motorhome has happened to us. Uh, you know, we, my parents traded a plot of land on a lake for their first mini Winnie. we actually went out to Winnebago and I believe that's headquartered in Wisconsin to get our brave I mean we've had a chieftain we've owned other companies but Winnebago was the standard that we had from when I was just tiny small I mean we could have had this beautiful lake house but no we had motorhomes our whole life or RVs and and just one I'll tell you a story one time I was we for the holidays we went to Arizona and it was you know my parents my dad would always create these road trips and my dad was a topographer cartographer so the maps were everywhere and we were out at the Grand Canyon and I was bored and all you know all the sand kind of got up on the back of I think we had a brave at that time And so I picked up a rock and I started to etch into the sand on the back of the motorhome where you unhook it and you pull it down and all your whole baggage is in the back there. And I thought, because I tried to do my finger, but it was just too, it wasn't very detailed. So I was making these nice little intricate um, scene on the back of the motorhome. And my dad comes back and, oh my God, the, the rock had etched into the fiberglass. And I had oh, ruined no. the entire, luckily it was the part that you could literally get replaced. Oh, my father had a fit. Um, the, this, the scene where you open up the um, dump tank and you forget to you know, hold it so it doesn't release while you're po- fixing all of your hoses and it goes in your face. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> the time that your generator goes out and it's a hundred degrees outside. Um, we were in Ohio and my dad always wanted to go on the, you know, the, the road less traveled. And for some reason the road was not finished and the motorhome literally was airborne for like 20 seconds. We literally flew off the road and landed like five, 10 feet down and oh, wow. had to get a tow truck to get us out. I mean, I could go on and on and on. But it, it's funny, actually. That since, so interesting, the fact that you're in Ohio, interesting statistic that in the United States, 85% of the rec- recreational vehicles sold are manufactured in Indiana. And roughly two-thirds of the production in Indiana is in one place, Elkhart County, which essentially calls itself the RV capital of the world. Uh, when um, growing up in Ohio, um, I just remember, you know, like, God, there seems to be a lot of advertising for people going to Indiana to go get RVs, specifically R- Richmond, Indiana. Well, when we were growing up, you know, we never stayed at a hotel. Ever. I didn't stay in a hotel until we moved to Germany. And it was just, my mother loved it. You you could, it's literally a dream. You just grab your wallet, load everybody in the motorhome. Everything is there. Everything that you need is there. You can end up anywhere at the end of the day. 
uh, it's 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 very romantic life. I I think I think it's it's a it's a wonderful way to travel. Ben, I, I think even ben more, was trying to say. Uh, oh, was, sorry, Dave, go ahead. I was going to say I'd been even more impressed if you told me you took the RV with you to Germany. Oh, we tried. Uh, <laughs> uh, ger- uh, military pay. We just couldn't pay for the freight. We we ended up now. That's a whole other story. We ended up buying a Dodge ba- panel van with windows in Germany and tented all through Europe. Like we we bought tents and sleeping bags and whole outdoor grill systems and tented our way through France and Germany and Switzerland, everywhere. Italy. It just sounds cool. Yeah. You know, the closest thing to the to that whole experience that my brother and I had was uh, back when we were little kids in the 70s, we had the little Tonka Winnebago which you know, was about two feet long, all made of pressed steel, had little husband and wife and cocker spaniel action figures that went with it. I had it. I had that. <laughs> I had it too. You know, this was one year. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and we, would sit on, we would sit on the roof of the thing and ride it down our steep driveway <laughs> and crash at the bottom. And that, that sucker took so much abuse and it just kept on ticking. We, oh. never, had a, a window. we never had an RV of any kind. Our, our, did, you have, did your family ever do the RV thing? No, no, I no, we never, never, uh, never did, never been in in one outside of you know going to an auto show or something like that. Funny story, however. So I was raised here. My wife, as Mick knows, uh, was raised in India. So she comes over late '90s and sees one of these things for the first time. And, and so now I'm going to use this opportunity to trademark this name. She go, and I, so I kind of told her a similar story, Dave. And so she <laughs> coined go. the name Runaway Go, <laughs> which is just apropos, right? Because to Don's point, you run yeah. away and you go, right? And you can do it immediately. So she has this fascination. So one of the bucket list items for both of us is for us, I don't think we'll ever buy one, but is to rent one. And take it across whatever section of the country that we're going to go. And, and again, you have to understand both of us, uh, you know, it will, it will not be um, <laughs> meager. Okay. So, so. It'll have to be, so it'll have to be a certain cut of, of runaway go that we will have to have in order to, to satisfy whatever our pleasures are. So, uh, so, but but very curious that today happened to be the day that you chose this topic because in our house it's a big thing to finally go on that so on that our, trip in a I, in an RV. I'll give you some and advice. So very, Last very summer, exciting. my 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 parents uh, when my dad. Um, was diagnosed with Parkinson's, sold their last RV. It's It's been mm-hmm. about five years. So my parents literally my entire life, like 50 years had an RV always. And so we rented one last year. And let me tell you, if you want a glamper, <laughs> which is the more upscale um, one that you're talking about, be prepared to pay a lot of money. I was shocked how much it cost us for a month in the smallest mini Winnie I've ever been in for adults and a dog. I am familiar. I have done the research. And so, you know, instead of going to Europe, I think we'll, we'll go week. on a trip in a glamour, as you say. So, yeah, I mean, it's, we, went, it's we went for an entire yeah, for month. Week. And let me for tell week, you what. Yeah. I, we have so many funny pictures and my sister and I would sit out by the campfire and just go, this is amazing. We love it. This is great. But we, but our heads were shaking back and forth. Like this is unbelievable (laughs) that we, the poor adults are literally doing this. And it was a special time because here's the other thing. My sister and I drove because my mom and dad can't drive the RVs anymore. And my sister ended up almost driving the whole trip she wouldn't let me drive she was so nervous (laughs) because there's so many blind spots and there's you know I mean there's a lot more technology on them these days I think it's a lot easier to drive but it's a little nerve-wracking to think about all those years my dad just jumped in and drove away and we never I would sleep in the back and my sister and I play games never even gave it a thought until we started driving Um, take some lessons (laughs) Here's my, yeah, sorry, Dave, go ahead. I was going to say, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, you have like never thought of anything laying in the back. When he drove off the road, maybe you should have changed that philosophy. (laughs) (laughs) 
Mm. All right. So here's my devil's advocate statement on this. As much as I, I truly love the romance of, of hopping into some sort of RV and driving to wherever you want to go, given as how expensive they are to either own or to rent, am I simply not better off loading up my car and renting hotel rooms wherever I want to go? No. You're not. No. It's worth every dime. Because it costs less to drive and maintain that car. It doesn't and, matter. It's not about it money. It probably costs a little less to just rent rooms. This yep. is not a cost-benefit analysis, it's not about my money. dear. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is a pure out experience that you cannot pay for by, without doing this. Yeah. Really? There is a culture around it. There, there's a camaraderie. There's there's a total romance to it. I'm I'm telling you, you won't know it until you do it. Right. Well, it, it, I've got to agree with Don. This is not a place where you impose logic, Mickey. The, you know, if, 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 if people use logic, no one would ever buy boats either. That's so true. Yeah. Well, I, I think what we do is car. I mean, we're car enthusiasts. We're, yeah. we're travel enthusiasts. I don't think money often comes in. Uh, you know, I mean, a lot of us are realistic, but I don't think it comes into play when you do these experiences. Well, and I think also, you know, it, it's in terms of money and finances, you also look at, you know, there, there's different classes of RVs, different costs, and they, and they, you know, they depreciate. So a lot of times buying one that's a year or two old, but not a lot of mileage on it is much more cost efficient. I, you know, I had to go back and actually, because I've been seeing the terminology um, for years. Um, and so went back and looked at the three, and I think this is useful to know the difference because class A, a motor homes are the ones that we've been talking about. These are the most luxurious and expensive ones. It's got a solid body. You know, these are the ones that will have tip outs and a washer and dryer and dishwasher and, and are, are super oh, yeah. high end. And then they, got, they may even have Corian counters. I mean, yes. Oh, all of that. We, we go to um, fireplaces all the time. <laughs> yeah. And and I look at these things, you know, that we walked into one that I'm like, has to weigh more than the city of Topeka, Kansas. <laughs> yeah. You've got class B motor homes, which are called low profile or semi integrated. Um, these ones are, um, you know, uh, usually have like a fixed double bed in the back of the vehicle, um, but there's no um, overhead bed above the cab of the truck. And then the class C is known as a coach built. Um, this is where the more built on a, a truck, cast, truck. Uh, truck chassis. And so you've got a bed, you know, um, put up over the top of the cab. Um, and, and you know th these are the these are the smallest ones. My experience from all my years ca camping, these are the smallest ones. These are the most expensive ones, and these are the ones most preferred by people who have like seven or eight enormous dogs. Class A. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. yes, yes, we have we have way. yes we have five Ridgebacks. Let's get the smallest vehicle we can and stuff them in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Abs I mean, it is. There is nothing I wouldn't I wouldn't change our RV experience for all the holiday inns in the world. I just there's it's so amazing. I mean, literally, I've got chills thinking about it, thinking about the times and the stories that my parents have told, the games that we've played. Um, one time, my grandmother made a big pot of halushki, and I'm ethnic. I'm Slovak, Greek, and French, and Italian, and. Um, uh, she made this huge pot, and it is when you're talking about halushki, the, it's you know it's pigs in the blanket in, in wrapped in sauerkraut, and and it's wow. it's a lot of very heavy flavors. Somebody who knows forgot to latch the refrigerator, <laughs> and we took a corner, and the entire refrigerator contents literally spilled out all throughout the cabin, and that halushki was everywhere everywhere yes holistic everywhere i mean it was crazy so you just you you're not going to find that at a holiday inn <laughs> and the look on my grandmother's face how long it took her to make that dish and oh she was swearing in slovak like i don't think i would ever see her swear <laughs> it's priceless there there's just i well, I think we're about out of time uh, for <laughs> cultural collision, I, but it's clear we need to come back and talk some more about the RV experience. <clears throat> yeah.
yes. We, so, yeah, we're we're, yeah. we're going to revisit this topic, you know, because we, we've only just only just scratched the, surf, the surface. We're just scratching it. the surface. So, yeah, Arf, I, I wish you great travels and find one and do this trip. <laughs> it is you will love it. We will. This this has been this has been an experience. I think to kind of nudge me in that direction. So thank Excellent. you, Arp. You uh, contacted us initially via Facebook saying that you wanted to talk about the Zen of options. What does that mean? So the Zen of options. So actually you had put out, I felt like I was solicited actually. <laughs> like, you know, we've talked some about sort that. Of, <gasps> sorry. Yeah, yeah. You know, two bit strumpet or something. I don't know. It was, uh, <laughs> and so, so the Zen of options, you know, I, I think the, the request, uh, perhaps my, my kind of sell was about, uh, uh, rain sensing windshield wipers and ventilated seats. And so we just recently uh, traded out of a, a, a Lexus ES 350 and got a little NX 300H. So there's just a, it's, it's like a, it's a smaller version of the RX uh, SUV or crossover and, you know, got through all the paperwork and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, well, it's got the rain sensing wipers, right? Because the, the, the 350 had that. And he's like, man, I, I think you got to pay like $4,000 extra for whatever package it is that gets you the rain sensing wipers. And so I'm thinking, we're, you know, so the whole, your whole line of questioning, Mick, and everything was, we, we've lost our focus when it comes to cars, right? So I'm looking at a picture of, of a bunch of cars in the background on on Mickey's Zoom uh, display, and and so this this whole thing of you know we've gotten into the rain sensing wipers and the ventilated seats, and how nice is it just to think about kind of the deep rooted aspect of a vehicle, right? And the engine and the steering and the but we've gotten so caught up in the Zen and meditating on all these accoutrements, right? That we've forgotten about the car. And what the car does for us, and where it gets us, and and you know, Don, I think you so, sort of the romantic element of the car. Everything is a commodity. How much more have we added? How much more are we going to get out of this? Now I know there's been a lot of safety features added, and you know, conditioning to make life nice, but we have lost our focus. And and look, I'm first one to tell you I've lost my focus because we're so caught up in this, you know, I'm, even yesterday when we were driving back and forth to, to Auburn to pick up our daughter, I don't have these rain sensing wipers. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> and I've become so accustomed I it to those them. those were your eyes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as they drop onto your windshield, well, Ben Ben and I have actually talked about this in the past. At some point, um, <laughs> it was online long before the thing about cars ever existed as a recording. I remember Ben saying things like, "You know, none of these things you're talking about have anything to do with the actual element of driving." Right. Um, but uh, anyway, please continue. Yeah, no, I, I think that the the conversation that you and Ben had was a foreshadow uh, of this program, I guess, because, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to go back and I can remember my first car was my dad's gold duster, 1976 gold duster, and I had a steering wheel kind of out to here. Obviously, the folks that are listening, yeah, I mean, you could, it was like hugging a 400-pound man or something. It was wonderful. I'm feeling personally attacked uh, by that comparison. <laughs> <laughs> and um and and so and then i had a my first car that i had was a cutlass salon and a chevy cutlass salon and it was a 350 four barrel you know all that stuff and it had this real kind of meaty engine but yet it was light blue color so it had this kind of you know daintiness about it i guess because <laughs> of the color and so you know but there, there's a there's a part of me that misses that, you know, that misses that pureness that and it had they had no accoutrements. I think the Cutlass had power windows was as good as it got. Right. The Gold Duster had nothing. In fact, you had to push a button in the left yeah, crank. Oh, most definitely. You had to push a button in the left top side 
to turn on the high beams. Oh yes, yes. yes. Actually, the floorboard. Yeah. Do you remember Actually, that? The floorboard. There was a little button in yeah. those cars. There was a little button. That you tapped with your left foot that put the high beams. Yeah. My husband and I were looking at a car the other day that had that, and he said, "Do you know what that is?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's a the high beams." He's like, "You know that?" I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> that's the old Plymouth had that. Yep. I don't. I don't. I every yeah. car that I ever drove up until the '90s had one of those. Right. So mine too. Um. And and now it's it's like you've got this lever and you've got to figure out and it's got auto you know with the lights and high beams and all again safety wise I love the fact that my high beams come on automatically right so yeah. if there's no one in either direction at night they come on you don't have to worry about turning them off but again you you're almost detached from the vehicle you know the 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 the, the again the pure elements of the vehicle have you um, are just no longer I will say the only thing that the only accoutrement or ad that I cannot live without now is a cup holder a cup holder yes. holder and car I, companies specifically market cup holders to women more aggressively than they do to men isn't that crazy but there I literally could get rid of everything else I'd be glad to have the button on the floor I'd be glad to roll up and down my windows crank them but that cup holder is just it's it's so important. It's crazy, and and multiple cup holders, you know. Arp, Arp, have you ever read the actual stor short story behind the Rush song "Red Barchetta"? I've not. Ben, you've read it, right? I think you were the one who handed it to me. Uh, yeah. And what's that story about? Can you give us a quick synop synopsis, Ben? Yeah, it takes place in a future age when uh, cars as we know them today uh, are, you know, not around anymore well not much anyway and keep in mind this was written in 1973 it originally ran as a short story in road and track but it takes place in some future age i forget if the year is specified and in this future these cars are all these big giant heavy safety mobiles that you know can run into a building and nobody will be hurt or something like that uh and good old-fashioned cars as you know we know them uh, are outlawed and the protagonist has an uncle who lives out in the country where now in the original story it was not a ferrari it was an mg uh neil peart turned it into a ferrari when he wrote the song but as the story goes the uncle has this old mg in a barn out in the country and the protagonist would go out there on weekends sometimes and drive the thing around uh and it became a deadly game because all the big giant safety mobiles would you know try to mow him down just for the fun of it because they would experience no damage no harm so you know, they, they have relative immunity, but they would, you know, try to get the guy in the in the tin can. Yeah, I think the story was called A Drive in the Country or something like that. Right. The idea being is that, you know, all these safety features left people with no responsibility whatsoever. Yeah. Mm. So. Yeah, I mean, and soon we're going to give up driving, right? I mean, we, we looked at a Tesla before we, we chose this, this Lexus. And why even have a car, right? Just have someone else drive. I mean, we have that now, right? But why even, if you're just going to take your hands off the steering wheel and just let the car go, I, I don't know if that, to me, satisfies some element of going for a drive, right? Because right? then you're just a spectator in what is clearly not a spectator sport. Right. Because <laughs> you're driving the car. You are driving the car. Yeah, I, I, and, and so, I get worried about that, Arp. Like, those of us that love to drive and then you have autonomous vehicles – you're going to be maybe the only human being sitting in the driver's seat and everybody else is going to be just kind of slayed back, reading a book, looking at their iPhones or their tablets. And, and, and then you're going to be like, what, what? Right. Right. So what's the upshot of all this Arp? How do we, how do we, you know, to use a pun, how do we steer ourselves away from that? Or, or can we simply not avoid it? It's just, just the way things are going to be from now on. I, I don't. I don't think you can avoid it. You know, there's there's too much uh, ambition and uh, you know, call it fiscal motivation, economic motivation to automate and 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 create this world of you know that that Mr. Peart uh, wrote so wonderfully about. And I, I think it's it's out of our hands. You know, I I think the beauty of it is something like this show, right? That just really kind of brings the focus back to RVs and and talk about automobiles more than just the the mechanical aspect of them but they're part of our culture they're part of our lives you know and and you can look at it not only 
kind of in in the world of vehicles, but in software and artificial intelligence and where are we going from a per, from the perspective of our humanness, right? Yeah. Is that is that we're diluting that every well, day? And and Every I day. think about the first time I went to buy a car as an adult um, and I wanted to talk with the salesperson about what was under the hood. I was very adamant that I wanted a six cylinder. I was very adamant um, about certain aspects, you know, a little bit about fuel efficiency, uh, how the car handled, um, you know, what the, what, how many, you know, gears did it have? And the guy kept trying to talk to me about cup holders and, and you know, oh, automatic windows and there's a, there's a moon roof. And, I, you know, that's the other part that's really hard, even for us as women, is when you do want to talk about what's under the hood, you get, you know, it's like, don't, let's, don't look behind the curtain. Let me show you something over here. And so, yeah, I think that's... Uh, uh, it's, you remember, it's, I remember when, when I decided to, to change careers and go into marketing and started to learn one of the, the industries that um, arguably both has some of the best and the worst marketing tactics are the automotive industry. And I remember reading case studies on how within General Motors, um, I think it was the Pontiac division was the division that was created to make women cars. That, and that was the, the cars that were specifically targeted at women. And, um, you know, Chevy, Chevy was the testosterone driven, um, you know, car, you know, so, so cup holders premiered in Pontiac models, not in Chevy models. Um, and and yeah, it, it, it does speak to, you know, these perceptions, you know, I think we, we, we've alluded to this in the show before, is there's a difference between driving as a utilitarian activity versus driving as something that you enjoy. Uh, and, and there, you know, when I was commuting to, you know, 30 miles every day to work, I would have loved to have had a self-driving car. But, you know, truth being is I would have just sat there and done email or, um, you know, written reports um, instead of enjoying it. But, well, yeah, yeah, you know, I, not to cut you off, Dave, but I'm, our, I'm wondering if the, this is all about the productivity, productivity of us as humans, and not the enjoyment that we have engaging and interacting with our technology. Yeah, just for the record, hit the nail on the yeah. head. Absolutely. Well, we are a little over time, but I, I want to, I do want to talk at that point. I mean, I, and I wonder if this is a uniquely American thing, or if the rest of the world is sort of adopting the same values. Um, you know, the, the whole aesthetic of appreciating an experience is something that is is interpreted differently in different countries. You know, and I'm thinking of Japan as a stark difference. You walk down any average city street in Japan and just the aesthetic at the way that things are arranged and, 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 and portrayed is, is very different than the way we do it here. Um, so are we talking about a cultural phenomenon or is this universal? Um, and is it simply a matter of aesthetics or is 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 are we talking about the next steps in human evolution. I know that's a stretch, but forgive yeah. me. Yeah. That's really deep, though. <laughs> Very deep. Uh, gonna... <laughs> yeah. Well, thank, Yikes. thank you for helping us to articulate that. I think that's something we need to talk about more often. Our, um, so for our guests, we always ask our guests uh, a handful of pretty standardized questions. Um, and my questions for you today are, our first three questions are pretty standardized anyway. What is your dream car? So my dream car is, and I can't tell you exactly which car, but I can tell you the features. And the pr most prominent feature is it's a four-door convertible. Okay. That is my dream car. Four-door convertible. Um, and, yeah. So I don't know, maybe uh, I'm smitten with Mikhail Gorbachev or someone else that, you know, had those types. I don't know who, who had those types of vehicles. but And they're so hard to find. And and I guess there's a lot of negative press on them because their structural integrity is so bad, mm -hmm. right? And so, but that would be my my dream car would be a four door convertible. Ben, does such a thing exist? Have you seen anything like that recently? Uh, well, nothing like that has been made recently, but it's not a completely foreign concept. Uh, yeah. Back in the '60s, there was such a version of the Lincoln Continental. Right. I'm thinking exactly of the Zapruder film, actually. Right, yeah. 
Yeah. Although that was, uh, yeah, by, the, by the time it gets turned into a presidential car, you can't really put the top up anymore. Exactly. Right, right, right. All right, Art, my second question. I'm sorry, Don. No, I was, I was thinking of there was a recent TV show with a bunch of guys who one of them was a movie star and that it was following his development as a star and he had like this posse of guys and they had the opening scene is the four of them getting out of a convertible and everybody opening a door and the back doors I think opened suicide yeah suicide wise uh, so I'm trying to remember I'll, I'll think uh, some that name of the show will come to me but I believe that was the opening scene Our uh, question number two is where is your next road trip sorry Don no good so yeah we were actually just talking about this this morning oddly uh, and and that road trip is is probably we've not been to like Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, that part of the world. And I think it's apropos that we go in a runaway go. I really do think that we, we take the runaway go and we go up there and, and do that road trip. So that would be our next road Excellent. trip. Don't know when given circumstances, but yeah. certainly that would be on the list. Excellent. Number three, question number three is what's the most fascinating thing you've seen in someone's house or garage? So the most fa and I'll, I'll since this is a car show and, and a show about cars I'll I'll, I'll speak to a garage. Uh, so I was up in Chicago land in the spring of 2019 at my cousin's place, and and they have a nice big house, very uh, I guess posh part of Chicago. They're both doctors, and so I walk into the garage, and so there's an assortment of very nice vehicles. And there is an Audi Roadster up on a on a jack or on a you know uh, like a lift. What you call that, but a yeah, a lift. And so I was just so fa I was like, wow, this is how the other half <laughs> lives. And and again, um, my my uh, cousin brother in law uh, is a very very modest guy, very very nice, and. And so, you know, I was I obviously you could see my eyes, you know, dilating and and the like. And and so when he went to drop me back off at the at the hotel later, you know, when we were leaving, um, he he pulled it off the rack and and we we hopped in in the in the Audi Roadster and and uh, and he took me back. So that was a that was a huge thrill. But just walking in on that. Uh, was was amazing, you know. Just to, wow, more you know, common wow, people actually yeah. do this. It's not like what you've got in the back, which is a full fledged garage, I presume. But this is in someone's. It's house. It's more common than you think, particularly in the car enthusiast crowd, because you know, a good four post hydraulic lift actually starts under five thousand hmm. dollars. So it's so, an easy way to store. Yeah, as long as you've got the vertical clearance, that gets you two yeah. parking spaces in the footprint of one. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's it. Very cool. All right. So uh, I'm going to go back and say that that it was, the show was Entourage, and oh yeah, yeah, the boys would drive in in a 1965 Lincoln Continental. It was there black, and it had the suicide doors in the back. Although these days, if you find a good four door sedan, you could just shop it and not you know not put up a, a convertible top, just leave it open. It's still technically an open drive convertible vehicle as long as you as long as you counter for the loss of structural integrity by removing the roof. Ben, ben looks like he's very pensive on this topic. Uh, well, the whole term convertible means convert to change, you know. So if you've right. chopped the top <laughs> off, it's not a convertible. It's open. It's open right? So, I can, you know, not every car is a potential convertible. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So the things we could do with a Sawzall. Um, all right, Art, my last question for you for today is, um, what is your biggest kitchen fail? Kitchen fail? Um... I had made, this is probably, gosh. I drive all of mine out of Mickey, my when we so lived in, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in in Kennesaw, I had made this bread with like, I had put, it was like a rolled bread and I'd put like, I can't forget, I, I can't remember what I'd put into it, but when it baked, it had all collapsed. And so you just had like this, you know, hanger uh, that was foodless. <laughs> it just there was nothing there. And everything had kind of settled and it had baked, but it just didn't have that, you know, that that sponginess, that bread-like texture you wanted 
because everything had just collapsed. So, you know, I want to do that again. I, I feel like I've improved as a as You want to do the same thing a, or something a, better? <laughs> something different, <laughs> but but the, the same kind of uh, approach uh, to see if I can improve upon that. But it's like you cut into it and it just, it was like the, going back to Christmas vacation, it turkey. was like the turkey exploded. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, that's not what we were expecting to come from inside. The so bread. did you make this from scratch? Did you I use did. E yeast, of course? Yeah, I so. Think two so. things you, I've done this. You either did <laughs> not let the yeast rise enough and let the dough recycle and rise as you put the yeast in, or your yeast was bad. It could have been either There's one of those. nothing though. worse than bad yeast. Or both. Mm -hmm. yes. And here's no, a good no. reason to get that RV so you can try this again while you're on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Because you'll have That's plenty right. of time. <laughs> exactly. I say with and my... remember to close the refrigerator door. Right. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Arp. This is good stuff. We need to definitely have you back on the show and talk some more about, you know, just the pure zen of driving, I think. Uh, maybe the way to I look forward and, to it. Uh, so, and now it's time for Ben to take a moment. Ben, take us away. Yeah, well, just to flash back there for a second, I'm also reminded of that Green Acres episode in which Lisa Douglas uses uh, hot cake batter to make a cylinder head for the old Ford truck. But uh, anyway, uh, no, I'm, I'd like to take a moment today to talk about, of all things, convertibles. And yes, I did actually plan that ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because it was a chilly morning today, and I went to a cruise in and look at all these, you know, pretty cars. And a bunch of them there had the tops down, despite the temperature being in the 30s when they got there. Uh, and, you know, I thought, you know, that's just a great kind of car. And if you've got the right spirit, it doesn't matter what the weather outside is. Uh, there's something about being able to change from sheltered to unsheltered. Of course, if you, if you go b back to the genesis of the automobile, uh, you know, they were all open initially. And I'm not sure when the term convertible came in, but the first ones were probably sold more on the ability to create shelter than to get away from shelter, uh, you know, as more and more people motored in bad weather and such. But, uh, you know, I'd never have owned one myself. My dad had several when I was a kid, and I'm thinking one of these days I really should. But You should. You should. Yeah, yeah. And you it, convertibles are the best. I have had nothing but convertibles for the last 22 years. Yeah, I, I remember wow. this one time, and it was too cold to put the top down, really. But this one weekend, when uh, you know, I was in the army, I was uh, my the base I was at was about an hour and a half from where my dad lived, uh, and uh, I woke up one Saturday morning to you know him knocking on the door of the upstairs bedroom I was sleeping in, and he comes in with uh, some car keys. He goes, you know, hey, what? do you think it might be fun if you uh, took the Alpha over to Alabama to see your mom for the weekend? I can have you back to the base in time on Sunday night. Uh, the Alpha in question was a 1976 Spider that he had. Wow. Uh, and so I said, yeah, I think I was uh, dressed and out the door inside of 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Here's here's two tricks. So I have, a, as you all know, 2004 CLK 320. And you can literally, it doesn't matter how cold, if you put the top down, but leave all the windows up and put the, the, um, the windshield, the windscreen up in the back. Now, granted, one of my windows is not going up right now. Let's, all right, we'll get there. But so you put the windscreen <laughs> up, you turn on the accoutrements heated seats, ARP, and you blast your heat. It doesn't matter how cold, you have a little bubble because the wind just goes over your windshield and you have a nice warm little bubble. This does work better with, you know, good modern ones that have good aerodynamics. You know. <laughs> and, yes. And it also works when you have heated seats. Yeah. Um, the other well, thing that you said, any weather, I have actually proven this in Florida. Fantastic. If I have, again, all the windows up and it is raining out and I can get up to 65 miles an hour straight away, the, 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 um, I will not get rained on. Yeah. I will not come in the car. You create right. this nice little stream and you are completely dry and it could be pouring down rain outside, so. I did the weather thing uh, last, I think it was last year in January. I had one of my business trips was down to Florida, you know, and I've done several of these where I'll look, look at who I have to visit and, you know, try to structure the travel. And for some of these trips, what I'll do is I'll take a one-way flight to my farthest point and then drive back hitting the customers along the way. And I had one of these where I had to start in Miami uh, and then I had a customer in Orlando and then another one you know, near the Florida, Georgia line somewhere. 
and I, it was January. I get to Miami. Of course, it's warm down there that time of year, but I get to the airport there. And I'm looking at the rental cars and oh my goodness, there's a convertible Mustang just waiting for me. Uh, so I grabbed it. And the whole way from Miami back to Atlanta, I had the top down except for about 20 minutes worth uh, one morning when it was a little chilly. But, you know, daytime, nighttime, I had that sucker down. And the Mustang has not only the door windows, but it's got two little quarter windows mm -hmm. that come up as well. Mm -hmm. So with those up, and then you aim the vents a certain way, the, the weakness of this, and it had heated seats <laughs> too, but the weakness of this is that there is a little eddy current that will come back right between the seats and hit you in the elbow with that particular uh, car. Oh, with that one. I was going to say, I've never had that problem. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you've got that rear shield in the Mercedes, then you're not going to have yeah. that. But uh, yeah, there, there was a time, um, my partner's on my first anniversary, we flew to Miami and I was like, you yeah, know, this is um, almost 30 years ago now. We, and I had rented a convertible because because one of the companies had just started like putting convertibles widespread in the fleet. And we we're going to rent a convertible at Miami Airport and we we're going to drive down to Key West for the for a long weekend. So get to the airport, go out to the lot. And I was given a convertible. It was a Geo Metro convertible with oh, a wow. yeah, with a three-cylinder engine. So all the way oh. down highway one, you know, like, you know, instead of the 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 great roar of a convertible is going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as soon as were you pedaling it? <laughs> yeah, as soon as we got past Homestead, um weather was nice. We'd dropped to the top both of us had our shirts off and just worked our way down um the highway to key west not thinking neither was thinking about the fact that we were wearing shoulder harnesses and so <laughs> arrived at this resort we're going to looking like we had been outside wearing bandoleros for you know two <laughs> yeah that's the 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 nice. beauty of, of a convertible is that there is also a lot of norms that you get used to. You, you know, you think, do I want a farmer's tan or not? Right. You, uh, you know, you have to think, I've already replaced the hydraulics on my convertible top because they wear out. They get sticky. Um, you have to remember to put that thing up and down even in the winter or by, the first time you do it in the, when the weather gets nice. It, ha it hates you and it fusses at you. Yep. Um, it's there's there's a lot. So thanks for bringing this to us, uh, Ben. Oh yeah. I'll take and I anytime you're anybody's welcome to come and take a ride with me. Sure. Oh, yeah. Person. Well, and one of those little mannerism things too. You know, my dad when when I was a kid, he had a, a, a small fleet of Sunbeam Alpines, and you know. These, yeah, these were, you know, old school, you know, they didn't have the great aerodynamics of your, your drop tops of today. And so my, my father was not a hat person at all. He never, ever wore hats unless he was driving one of these sunbeams. He kept one in the glove box to keep his hair from getting completely messed up. Because <laughs> with those old school oh. poor aerodynamics, the, you know, the wind would come over the, the screen there, just curl back and batter the back of your head. And, you know. <laughs> so that is, a, that's another thing. I keep a hair um, clip in my car or I end up having a knotted mess wherever right. I go. Yeah. I, uh, I don't have any of these problems being <laughs> a completely bald individual, but, but I would keep a hat in the car just to avoid the third degree sunburn that I would inevitably get. Yeah. On the yep. Yep. top of my poor head. Yes. So thank you, Ben. Anything else? Oh, that's about it. How about we do a quick moment of listener slash viewer mail? Um, I actually found a car question. Uh, and we briefly discussed this on our uh, Think About Cars talk group on Facebook, our, our little chat element where a friend of ours says that whenever she turns on her, her heater, she would smell something that smelled like horses coming out of her vents. And so we, I guided her through some of the other options we talked about and asked her some more questions. It turns out she only smells this horsey smell when she turns on the defroster, not the heater, not just the heater, right? So she can turn on the heater and it, that smells fine. But whenever she turns on the defroster, this, this musty, horsey smell comes out of that. And she's trying to figure that out. So I did suggest spraying Lysol into the ventilation intakes and changing her cabin filter. But if none of the other ventilation options are producing a musty odor, it's probably not the cabin filter. Um, but uh, so she's going to do the Lysol thing and, and get back to us. But I thought I'd throw that out there for general discussion now in case, in case this revelation of it only happening when 
the defroster is on is relevant? Oh, well, I think of something right away. Yeah. Uh, the, the defroster ducts are the only ones that point up, which means mm -hmm. things can fall in them. Right. Yeah, I'm, and I'm thinking there might be mold in there because if you think about it, that's where you're the condensation and that's why we use defrosters anyway. So she may have mold growing. That's, that's That was my original thought. Yeah. Any number of possibilities there, yeah. Right, which still takes us back to spraying some Lysol in the vent and then having it run on defrost for a while and maybe that will solve the problem. Um, so I hope she does get to solve it. Um, I, I want to share another worst car you ever owned story since we have a little bit of time here. Um, you guys might get a kick out of this one. My friend Marisa says she had a Renault Le Car that was gifted to my ex by his brother. And somehow Marisa is the one who ended up with it. She says it was hideously ugly and a total dog. Things that didn't work, the things that did not work included the heat, the radio, second gear. She had to roll it and pop the clutch to start it. Basically could not lock it because it had a cloth top. So you could just pop off and you could put your head, hand down a window uh, and, and push in a little bit to get the window down. Also, it had no air conditioning, of course, and it rattled and was super top heavy around turns. It's true. I've actually seen a Renault Le Car tip over on, on what I thought was a, a no-brainer turn before. Uh, she says, I'm sure I've forgotten a few of its other faults. Also, when we got it back, the seat was completely full of garbage, mostly fast food refuse, and empty White Owl cigar boxes. I don't know if White Owl's a cigar thing or not. Anyway, she says, I won't talk about the lovely aroma. Um, <laughs> so Renault Le Car counts as Marisa's worst car she ever owned. <laughs> you know, I've never heard anyone refer to the uh, either the Renault Le Car or its sister, the Renault Alliance, or as we called it in college, the Renault Appliance, <laughs> as as their favorite car. <laughs> it's a, it was, yeah, it was a it was it's a workhorse starter car, and it's the fact that it's called Le Car. <laughs> <laughs> like, just... Ta da! <laughs> Yeah, you know, that, I don't want to downplay anybody's appreciation of these things. If if what you like is a Renault Le Car, more power to you. Yeah, um, but but I'm you know, still. You know, I'm sure but, there's a there's a some you know skinny jeaned hipster somewhere in the United States who has one that he's very proud of and takes to cruise ins. Right, <laughs> and should right. be. I mean, that should a be. Car, yeah. You know. Well, to wrap it out, my friend Jennifer then wrote back to Marisa. She says, "You just unlocked a memory for me." She says, I sort of learned to drive stick on a Le Car when I was around 13 on a farm. Uh, that car was Hunter Safety Orange, and we spray painted the outside with three shades of gray and brown to make it look camouflaged, but the interior remained that awful orange color. It was a fun little card for us as kids and teens just to joyride through the country on the farm uh, or pretend to go hunting when we were really sneaking terrible beers and just generally goofing off. Mm -hmm. um, she says, what's funny is that her dad bought a pair of them so that he could take parts off of one to fix the other, but they were both so terrible, eventually he hauled both of them off to a scrap dealer and made a bit of his money back. So interesting stories from a couple friends about a car. Yeah, if you want to see the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, of course, they only called it Le Car in the United States. It was just their, their marketing gimmick over here. In Europe, it was the R5. Right. Uh, and, you know, basic wheels in France and Germany and places like that. The opposite end of the spectrum there was a mid-engine turbo version that was made for uh, homologation to qualify for Group B racing. So if you look up the uh, R5 Turbo 2, that is really something. <laughs> huh. Interesting. And that yeah, I would have in a heartbeat. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. Um, and that wraps up our listener viewer mail segment. If any listener or uh, uh, any of our family of Thing About Cars friends has a story they want to share or a car question they want to ask, uh, please contact us through our Facebook page. And uh, that's the thing about cars. Just search for the thing about cars on Facebook groups and you'll find us. Um, let's let's switch gears back down to our grand trivia auto question before we before we exit out of the show. Uh, ben, you wanna you wanna wrap this one up for us? Yeah. So uh, let's see. I think I've do I still have it? Yes, I do <laughs> still have the page with the <laughs> with the choices here. Uh, good. I uh, thought I'd close that. So the question was, where did the name of the Lincoln car brand come from? Uh, was it A, Henry Leland chose this name uh, to honor President Abraham Lincoln? B, British immigrant Richard Trevithick founded Lincoln Boiler Company in 1844, and in Old English, Lincoln means fresh water, blah, 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 eventually made cars. Or C, Lincoln is the name of the uh, enormous palace in the center of Luxor, Egypt, that the pharaohs had, which investors thought sounded cool. 
let's let Arp have our first guest here uh, as our guest of honor. Uh, I'm an Anglophile. I'm going to go with B. B. All right. Don, what do you think? I'm trying not to be a brainiac on this one. So, and I know a lot about Egypt. I'm I'm going to go with the president, President Lincoln. Dave? Just going to call yeah. it. Okay, Dave? Let's see. Arpa's gone for the British version. Don's gone for this. I'll go for Luxor. And I know the answer because I saw the question come in. Um, ben, what's the answer? Uh, the answer is A, the president. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hey, Don. <laughs> I, the other two just sound so far-fetched, and I am an, an Egypt um, amateur historian, so I was like, I've never heard of Lincoln. Dealing with <laughs> it, it is an old English name, though, so there's a little plausibility to be. Yeah, right. but C seemed really far-fetched. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Lincoln one, Palace. The funny one, there is actually, there was a Lincoln Palace. Um, it was an old bishop's palace in Lincolnshire in England. Yeah. So. So I'm like, okay, Just not in Egypt, not shaped yep. like nothing shaped like a pyramid. Nothing shaped like a pyramid. So cool. All Thank right. you, Tim, for the excellent trivia question from our friend Tim. Um, and that takes us to the end of this episode of, of the thing about cars. Anybody got any quick parting words for our for our family and friends? Just ask oh. everybody to uh, to uh, give us reviews and rate us online. Yeah, that's right. And, yeah, yeah. And ask others to join because uh, we're getting a lot of folks saying you're very approachable, and we want people to learn about cars and love cars like we do. Yeah, and have as much fun as we do too. So please do, please leave your ratings. And uh, if you have any questions, like I said, just contact us via our Facebook page or our website. That's the thing about cars.com. In the meantime, we hope you and yours are staying safe out there. We will see you with another episode in about a week. Take care, everybody. Bye. Later. Bye. 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 This has been The Thing About Cars. We'll see you on the road.